Understanding compliance requirements for jewellery in the United States is essentially a matter of understanding substance restrictions. We have, say, ASTM F999, which applies to jewellery for adults. It sets various restrictions when it comes to... Um, I actually have to check my phone. I can't remember the, the list of substances. But in any case, it includes uh, arsenic, barium, cadmium, chromium, lead, mercury, and so on, the usual suspects. My understanding is that this standard is not, not mandatory, but could still be, let's say, made mandatory if it's at some point in the future referenced uh, by a regulation in the US. Perhaps it already is on a state level or something like that. Or in case, let's say, Amazon would decide that they now require compliance with ASTM uh, yeah, <laughs> F2999. Sorry, I actually had to double check that getting a bit late over here. So that's the first one when it comes to substance restrictions. Then we also have ASTM 2923 which applies to children's jewelry and again it covers substance restrictions i think they are the, the list is uh, similar to the one i just mentioned but it also goes a bit further it covers warning symbols it covers uh, mechanical requirements what that is referring to could be let's say potential safety risks with say bracelets or uh, necklaces or, or so on I haven't read the standard, but I can imagine it covered provisions for small parts and strangulation risks and, and so on and so forth. The difference is that this standard, uh, what was it again? ASTM F2923, sorry, I can't remember. I can't be expected to remember all of them, right? Is, is de facto mandatory in the sense that CPSIA applies to all products, the age group, from 12 year olds and, and younger, okay? And what CPSIA says, well, it states, is that it's up to you as the importer manufacturer to identify the relevant safety standards. And I'm not sure if this one is actually explicitly referenced, but I imagine that if you would import or manufacture jewelry in the US, then this would at least be one of the standards that you would include in the testing procedure. Other than that, you will also have to issue a, a uh, children's product certificate, uh, CPC, and make sure that the product and the packaging also carries a, a tracking label. So these are all requirements of uh, CPSIA. I also believe that uh, it's fairly common that when it comes to children's jewelry, that these products are also tested according to ASTM F96317. That's one I can actually remember without looking up my phone. But in any case, so it may not necessarily be that you're only looking at this one standard, but you also have to arrange testing and, and make sure that the product is compliant also with uh, ASTM F963, which actually applies to, to toys primarily, okay? My recommendation when you try to determine this is that both when it comes to applicable ASTM standards and also the, let's say, corresponding substance restrictions and mechanical requirements and so on, that you should go to a qualified lab Preferably a CPSC accepted lab like Kima or Intertech, Bureau Veritas, SGS, and so on. No random lab that you never heard of, and let them assess the the standards and the restrictions, meaning substance restrictions and mechanical requirements that actually apply. Okay, so that way you don't have to make this assessment yourself or request this from someone that is completely unqualified, such as your supplier. That's something you should definitely avoid. Then there's also California Prop 65. So California Prop 65 is a state regulation in yes, it's in, in California and it restricts, I think more than 800 substances, right? And it's, uh, it, I think it overlaps. I think it overlaps, but goes beyond the restrictions on the ASTM list, okay? On, well, this, the list of these two standards that I just mentioned, or even three of them. But there can be differences in, term, in terms of the, the limitations. And again, it actually goes beyond that. The difference is that California Prop 65, California Proposition 65, it's not specific to jewelry. It applies to essentially all consumer products sold in, in, in California. And you have the option of verifying compliance, which in practice means testing or affixing warning labels. 
So yeah, these are the two paths. That's that's at least my understanding. Then there are at least used to be some provisions when it comes to say the number of employees and so on, and and the responsibilities uh, were affected by the size of your business and so on. But most of our customers, I would say, when it comes to jewelry in the U.S., they do arrange uh, California Prop 65 testing, and once again, it's the exact same approach as as when it comes to ASTM compliance that you shouldn't really try to figure out the exact substance list on your own. Go to a qualified testing company, ask them to assess which substances apply, well, which substance tests apply. And again, this can differ depending on the material. It's not like you arrange testing for all 800 substances, 800 plus substances that are regulated in one way or the other, meaning limited or banned under California Prop 65. No. If you would have this watch, for example, right? So what do we have here? We have a leather strap. We have a case, a stainless steel case, no coating. We also have glass, a glass cover. Well, you would apply different tests to to different components. For the leather, you would maybe primarily focus on phthalates uh, that you could maybe find in certain composite materials. Well, it's a plasticizer. Um, coatings and so on, whereas for the the, uh, the stainless steel case, would primarily uh, array, test according to uh, heavy metals. Another thing that can be challenging when it comes to jewelry compliance is the lack of transparency, or should I say, the lack of documentation in in the jewelry industry. Something that, like, if you let's say, let, let me put it like this. Um, sorry, I got a bit lost here, but let's say that you are planning to get um, a bracelet manufactured uh, overseas, somewhere in Asia, and you find a supplier online. The chances that a jewelry supplier will be able to provide, uh, let's say, lab test reports corresponding to any ASTM standard or, or California Prop 65 is very slim. The reason is that the jewelry industry, the way it works is that jewelry manufacturers right they don't tend to make components in-house what they do is they're procuring components from a long list of suppliers a a, a wide network of highly specialized uh, uh, jewelry component uh, subcontractors that that's really the way it works and, and the truth is that many jewelry suppliers they simply don't have any data or knowledge as to whether they're components, and it could be, say, zinc alloy, stainless steel parts, plastic beads, etc., all sorts of jewelry parts, as to whether or not these are compliant with CA Prop 65 or with the various ASTM standards, they simply don't know. So what this means is you can't rely on pre-existing test reports as these, generally speaking, don't exist. You have to instead rely on third-party testing when you're importing either finished jewelry or uh, jewelry parts into into the United States, given the fact that there's simply not enough transparency in, 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 in the industry. So, yeah, there's also more to jewelry compliance in the US. You can find a fairly comprehensive guide on compliancegate.com covering this topic. You can, of course, scroll down, uh, write a comment. You can do the same if you're watching this on YouTube. And I also recommend that you subscribe if you want more of these videos. So thank you for watching.